I went to the Alliance High School. <laughs> I did. <laughs> I really did. And that's where the trauma really kicked in. You see, I was a very bubbly child growing up, but the adults around me always found really creative ways to dim my shine. They called me mischievous, they called me naughty, they called me too jumpy, they called me playful, notorious, you name it. So going to the Alliance High School was an act of rebellion for me. <laughs> because Bush was the preserve of the silent genius, of which I wasn't. So if you went to 844, you realize, you remember that we had to choose schools in four levels. Weeks before we start our Kenya Certificate of Primary Education exams, we had to select national schools, provincial schools, district schools, and zonal schools, right? I only wrote one school, the Alliance High School. <laughs> and this caused quite a bit of commotion in my school because nobody had ever exhibited such kinds of confidence or hubris. And I wanted to go to Bush so badly, and went I did. But high school was going to be such a challenging experience because I come from a very humble background. We lived in a single-roomed blue tin shack in Karen. Those of you who know where Karen is, you know it's one of the leafy suburbs of Nairobi, yes? But our home was more leaf than it was suburb. <laughs> I did most of my assignments on my lap because we did not have a table, and my dad was reminding me of this, but I was the eternal optimist as a child. Going to high school was going to expose me to class difference, something that I had not thought about until we walked through those glorious gates. I saw a multitude of well-polished students in brand new school uniform and nice shoes, and on the upper field, the upper field was littered with Nice-looking cars. It's the first time, despite knowing how much my parents had sacrificed, I looked at them and felt as if their sacrifice was not enough. I was wondering, why wasn't my school uniform matching the ones of the others? Why did we have to go to a fundi to get my shorts done? Why didn't we buy it from a reputable store? Why didn't I have snacks? Why didn't we come in a car? Why was it hard for me to get a box? Why hadn't we eaten for that whole day? Why, why, why? But that admission process was going to be just but the beginning. See, my academics felt like a trauma response. Let's take a detour to when I was 11. I was sexually assaulted, and uh, I faced months of bullying. See, one time after church, because I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, in the afternoon, as boys are wont to do when they're full, we decided to throw K apples and see who would throw it the furthest. And so when my turn came, I just remember picking it up and launching it as far as I could. And it hit one of the youths in church. Now when they, my friends saw the mob charging towards us, they ran away helter-skelter, but I stood there transfixed upon that ground with an apology in my mouth knowing that that would suffice. When those boys came, they wouldn't hear nothing about it. And this marked the beginning of several months of bullying. They were very creative with the bullying tactics that they would employ on me. But one particularly stood out. It's when, after class, I went to the urinal to ease myself, and they walked in. It was a clogged urinal in a church. And they told me that if I did not drink from that urinal, they would beat me up. So I was afraid of being beaten up by a group of boys. So I knelt down and took a little sip from that God-forsaken, cursed, clogged urinal. And I can still remember its taste in my mouth. That's the day I lost my sense of disgust. They laughed heartily and gleefully and left me. I was free. I can explain where the bullying started and what I had done to deserve it, but I can't quite tell you what I did to cause the sexual assault. You see, children do not know what to do with sexual information. That's why you find a lot of people come out many, many years after it happened. It's because when you're sexually assaulted, you feel worthless, you feel filthy, and very dirty. It's an ever-enduring feel, feeling of dirt. Those two events, the bullying and the sexual assault, together with the unwavering faith that my parents had in education, being the great equalizer, is what caused me to excel in my studies. 
but it's also responsible for the fact that I do not play football and I don't take any interest in that sport. This is because my assailant enjoyed the sport and I felt really unsafe around the older boys. That's why my sport of choice is swimming, because swimming gave me a chance at washing away the ever-enduring dirt. So with every stroke I took, I, feel, I felt like I was temporarily relieved. High school proved to be an experience for which I was not sufficiently equipped. Um, since I had not dealt with the trauma that I had faced years prior, with the revelation of certain words, I fell into depression. And I remember that's the first time I was a suicidal boy. I was so confused, I was in so much pain, that one time I walked out of the class, in my Form 2 class, and walked to the school hall, tied a rope in a noose onto one of those poles that are used to hoist the curtains, and I just wanted to make the pain go away. So I tied it in a noose around my neck, and I jumped. I must have stayed in the air for about five to seven seconds, and I felt the rush, I felt the excitement in knowing that it was finally going to end before I fell down. I went back to class really embarrassed and in so much pain that I could not make this thing go away. Every time I used to cry for attention from my peers and from my teachers, but it seems as if at the time nobody knew how to deal with mental disturbances. We were not sufficiently equipped. I had overt struggles, and those revolved around my poverty. As an extroverted child in the Alliance High School, you could not afford to be poor, because you cannot be extroverted without influence. So I used to run away from my parents every time they would come to visit me in school, despite the fact that they never came empty-handed. They always brought something, even if it were a small bunch of bananas or drinking water. They always came. But I missed out on quality time with my parents because I was embarrassed of their poverty. And since I know they are watching, I would like to apologize. I was a teenager and I didn't know better. I sought solace in the dorms or the music centers because I, couldn't, I didn't want to be seen as this poor kid who cannot afford snacks or nice clothes or even to talk to girls. That's why I also did not apply for any sponsorship despite every other assembly, a company coming to say they wanted to sponsor 10 students or 15 or 20, I just could not afford to be seen around poverty. Poverty robs you of dignity. There's a shame about it, and if I were to tell you a thing about it, I'd tell you in this world, be anything you want to be, but poor. My covert struggles revolved around my sexuality. Because I had not dealt with the sexual trauma, the words that were being thrown around in high school reminded me of the person I was. And I'm talking about it, and I feel like a weak human being, like a very weak man to admit this on a global stage. But I'm here tonight to speak on my trauma and to overcome it, because if you talk about these things, about the issues in your life, they no longer overpower you. You get to power over them. Thank you. I'm also doing this so that if any teenager stumbles upon this video who's gone through the same thing I went through and they're struggling to figure out who they are, they might find solace in knowing that another person has gone through the thing that they went through. I, I had a very rough high school experience, as you, you can tell. I got suspended severally from the Alliance High School until one day I was indefinitely suspended, which I think was euphemism for an expulsion. And uh, at that time, my parents had moved to Kisumu, and so I stayed home for more than six months, doing nothing, being a bright boy, losing friends, losing all kinds of influence. And from our estate, I was the only person who had gone to that national school. So everybody was whispering, what has he done? Was he expelled? Is it school fees? Is he a devil worshiper? Is it drugs? Like everybody was just asking all the stupid questions, you know. And that's when I found a companion in porn. You see, my mom's laptop that stayed was my best friend because I had unfettered access to every adult human like, entertainment site. And I scoured through all those until I found no more joy in it. And then I fell into depression. 
So I was here, this young boy staying at home with nothing to do, severely depressed, but I cannot voice it because it's even a privilege that I'm alive. How are you expelled and you expect to stay alive in an African household? <laughs> but God, God being a God of second chances, afforded me another opportunity to get a short at high school experience and I was admitted to Miranda High School. There, I found the chance to be re-socialized, and I remember I scored an A-, minus, which is a thing I would not have scored when I was in the Alliance High School, because I was a D student. I went to campus at the Technical University of Kenya, where I studied a Bachelor of Commerce in Finance and graduated with honors. But campus days, campus days were fun. They were fun because I was free. I was free to do whatever I wanted. I was free to sate the curiosity I had about the nightlife. When we moved to Kisumu, we had to board an easy coach to come to Nairobi, and then you'd have to walk the entire stretch from railways to commercial, where you take the 105 matatus that go to Kikuyu. Along that stretch, by day it's a business avenue, by night it's a red light district. And I remember walking, seeing skimpily dressed sex workers and desiring them and hearing them whisper, Kucha baba ni kwanyeshe. Kushika ni bure. Kucha tu. Kucha ni kwanyeshe. That curiosity that was spooked in me in high school never went away. And I acted upon it the moment I joined campus because I had unfettered freedom. I miss my friends when they would have stories about the way they were in relationships and sex talk, and they were talking about body counts and whatnot. My mission was one, to dominate them, to have the highest possible body count, but still look like a saint. I hid this behind, um, quite meticulously, behind my showy dressing and my quick-witted tongue. But I was struggling. And then the depression came back and I would stay in the house for days on end without eating, without showering, without any interest in life. And then I would also have really high highs, days when I would have lots of sex with very many different people, still not needing to eat or sleep. You see, I felt as if I had encountered some sort of social death where my body meant nothing and it could be used by anyone at any time for anything. It was until very recently, in the weeks that led to the 9th of October 2023, that I knew I needed help. I had been struggling with very low lows and very high highs. And on this particular day, I got into a near fatal accident on Thika Road. And I was wondering, why did I not die? Because my friends saw this on Twitter, and they asked me, was that your car and thicker? And I was like, no, because I was so embarrassed that I got into a car that was almost written off, and I did not die. This is because I had attempted suicide thrice the month before. I just couldn't seem to do it. I just could not seem to take the pain away. That's when my friends tricked me into a mental institution. I hate the treacherous approach by which people are admitted into such institutions. But I also appreciate the fact that if it's done for a person who's incapable of making decisions, I see its logic. I'm still mad at my friends. I haven't forgiven them for that act, but I also appreciate it. There's a duality in it. There, I was also really mad because I was lumped with addicts. If you know me, I do not have a drug problem. I've only consumed alcohol once in my life, and that was the day after my accident. I think I took six cans of beer, and I smoked two buckets of cigarettes. And as we all know, you do not become an addict by your first sip, or your first line, or your first smoke. <laughs> so being lumped with addicts gave me this superiority complex until it was about the second week of spending time with them that I started having empathy for people in the shackles of addiction. And I realized that I'm not, I might not be addicted to drugs, I might be addicted to other things. You see, we were meant to love people and use things, but I had gotten to the point in my life where I used people and loved things. 
It's one of the things that I quite realized about myself in my rehab experience. And I, I learned empathy. I learned to empathize with people who are struggling. I stand here dis disclosing my diagnosis. I was given a diagnosis of bipolar disorder, ADHD, and anxiety disorder. Saying this jeopardizes the kinds of ambitions that I have because I have such lofty ambitions and part of the qualifications of those things is you cannot be mentally unwell. But I'm here to share my story, hoping that it will impact even if it's one person that will be impact enough for me. That is why this evening I ask us to stand together in unity, holding space for one another, offering grace to the people who are in pain, and asking you in whatever way you can to create a safer world for children. For it is in the thick of things that lies the power to rise, to triumph, and to shine a light onto each other's path. My name is Kazuo Makore, and I'm really grateful for tonight. Thank you.